on the zero uh, intro PDF, uh, number the number zero PDF. So I'm going to go through that. We'll see if it takes me the whole 50 minutes. And um, so uh, welcome to uh, Geology 757. Um, this class has changed a little bit from uh, not the very last time that I offered it, but the time before. Uh, it has become the uh, more advanced parts, uh, the less, um, shall we say, formulaic parts of uh, uh, what I used to teach as uh, both geology 706, um, geophysical filtering, and, uh, and uh, geology uh, 757, which is um, uh, seismic imaging. Um, so I'm really combining material from both of Clarabout's uh, um, middle books. Uh, there's um, a lot of material that we're going to start with from uh, Imaging the Earth's Interior, for which you can get a 50-page by 50-page uh, PDF of the printed book. Um, the printed book is also on reserve in the De La Mer Library. You get, uh, I think, four hours or overnight. Um, and let me, if, if, if that doesn't, if that's just not working for you guys and you really want the printed book, let me know and I'll take it off reserve and, um, and just give it to you. Um, I have some more copies myself as well, um, although they're buried in my office along with everything else. And uh, I've managed to uh, kill the uh, projector. Let's see here. Just by just by moving my uh, um, just by moving my my Thunderbolt uh, uh, connector, um, it's too loose. Okay, so um, uh, as well, um, I think so. Given the interests of uh, of uh, the three of you, uh, Travis, Joe, and Kyle. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time in this revised class, which I call Advanced Seismic Imaging and Introduction to Tomography. I'm going to spend most of it on Advanced Seismic Imaging and most of it out of Imaging the Earth's Interior, and um, somewhat less than I have in the past out of um, Processing versus Inversion. Um, uh, but uh, you know we can always have course corrections as we go along, and um, I actually um, uh, I forgot to get the list of um, desired topics from uh, from Kyle yesterday, and I I want to see it from uh, from uh, the other two as well. So um, you know we can certainly make uh, course corrections here. All right, so. What I'm going to do for uh, an introduction to advanced seismic imaging is show you some examples of projects that I worked 10 or 15 years ago. Now, um, why are these still of any interest at all? I think as uh, Joe and Kyle found out this last summer, and as, as Travis no doubt already knows, um, the um, uh, these techniques that that uh, you know, I guess I'll, I'll claim to be one of the pioneers from 20 years back. Um, they're totally standard now. And uh, uh, I'm talking uh, with Travis, for instance, about replacing the, um, the, the stacking exercises that I have in, um, uh, in my applied geophysics course for, uh, for seniors. Uh, I'm talking about replacing that with um, uh, some real seismic imaging. You know, making my uh, uh, pre-stack depth migrations and um, uh, optimized velocities and all that much more accessible to the undergrads as well. So uh, you know, this is this is uh, still valid because uh, all the techniques that I'm that I'm addressing here are. You know, in, in, in much improved form, you know, been worked on by uh, over the last 15 years by, um, you know, many, 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 uh, you know, very, very good, uh, very, very capable people. Um, all of these uh, techniques are, are just what's expected now. 
you know, maybe not in the in the hamstrung Nevada geothermal industry, but uh, you go anywhere in the oil patch anywhere in the world, and if you're doing um, seismic imaging uh, under contract, this is the minimum of what you have to provide. Okay, and so uh, that's uh, really my purpose here is to make sure that you guys are completely up with the modern modern practice, and um, I hope. Um, you know, those of you who have been in industry, which all three of you have, um, I hope that you will give me some uh, uh, some further advice. You know, because there are many things that industry is doing that I don't know about, and um, uh, so please, you know, uh, and and this goes in general for any of my lectures, any of our sessions here, uh, and we can even hear Travis, uh, which is amazing. So. Um, uh, just jump in anytime. Don't worry about uh, interrupting me. And uh, any comments you have, any corrections, uh, please do. So I'm going to go through a uh, an example from um, uh, a project that um, Rob Abbott and I worked in uh, Dixie Valley. Rob Abbott is a PhD graduate of mine from uh, I think 2001. He's now at Sandia Labs. I've uh, been a scientist there for some time. Um, and uh, it's basically a tectonic, scientific and tectonic problem uh, that uh, we recorded reflection data for. And um, uh, the uh, sort of standard stacking and migration, uh, the kind of migration that you heard about and we, we programmed up in um, uh, Geology uh, 70, 706, you know, the, the uh, Stolt migration, um, that handled it uh, like halfway, okay? So the, uh, you know, maybe half of the results we got out of um, uh, Dixie Valley we could get with uh, the old uh, ancient techniques. And what I'll show you today is uh, uh, what we could get uh, out of some advanced seismic imaging. And then... Um, the, uh, on the impact origin of uh, a structure called Upheaval Dome, which is in Canyonlands National Park, um, I'll talk about um, how we achieved a, uh, a pre-stack depth migration. And um, given that we uh, had uh, um, uh, even, even in this area, you know, absolutely accurate and... Um, uh, velocities were not required, so uh, fairly simple velocities worked well enough, uh, and that allowed us to um, to achieve depth migrations that uh, that we could actually match with a well log uh, that was very near our uh, our survey. And again, this had a uh, scientific impact. Um, although, if you go to Upheaval Dome and look at the Park Services. Uh, 30-year-old uh, uh, informational signs at the overlook of Upheaval Dome. Uh, you, you might not be able to tell, but uh, it has been confirmed. Um, what what did you mean by velocities were not required? Uh, well, velocities, uh, 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 there is not the degree of lateral velocity heterogeneity such that the, uh, the, op the velocity optimization process or, or a velocity tomography <laughs> was critical. Um, so a, a, a Peel Dome is an example of a, of a survey, uh, a prospect where the um, um, you know, standard velocity analysis worked well enough, but still, uh, even through that relatively simple velocity model, you had to do uh, advanced seismic imaging, pre-stack depth migration to uh, resolve the, the stratigraphy and structures that you wanted to. Yes. What type of well data did you guys have? Uh, I'll show you. It's uh, basically what I used was an acoustic log from so the you '60s. Guys had, like sonic and density and stuff. Uh, there were there was some. This is a uh, a well that was um, drilled right before they made Canyonlands a national park. So um, you know it was not a not a real prospect, but but they uh, they still. Did a pretty good job, you know. They got they got all the standard stuff. Um, I there might have been gamma gamma, but uh, not a better density log than that. Um, and I don't know I don't know if you could use a plutonium source um, 
you know, like for a neutron log anywhere in the Colorado River Basin. I'd, 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 I'd wonder whether, whether that would even be allowed. Um, and this is before the era of more modern density logs as well. But all I can, um, the, um, the, the, I, I used the acoustic log mostly because it was very easy to apply and it showed me what I, what I wanted to see. Um, uh, there was also, of course, uh, I remember there being caliper and two, uh, two different lengths of, uh, of lateral log, uh, electromagnetic log. Uh, okay, uh, then we had a, uh, you, you may not know about this, but there was a 3D seismic survey right in our own backyard here in um, Steamboat Hills. That was done in uh, late 1999, uh, early uh, 2000 by uh, Optum. And uh, that really required um, uh, a, a big effort in uh, advanced seismic imaging. You know, to look through, this is one of the first surveys where we were able to look through the volcanic pile and see faults uh, that cut the volcanic stratigraphy. So uh, this is not a great example of, of imaging volcanic stratigraphy. That had to come later. But it's a great example of, of fault imaging. And, and then there's a story that goes with, the, uh, uh, with, with that as well. Um, there's a, a little survey done uh, as uh, part of the um, um, part of the master's thesis work by uh, Ken Mila, uh, who is now um, teaching in the Veterans Upward Bound program at TMCC. And um, he did an ultra high resolution seismic image of um, a mine bench, a um, diatomite mine bench near Fernley. Uh, so we're talking about seismic imaging on a scale of 10 meters, no more than that. Uh, and uh, for this kind of thing, uh, and, and for imaging the vertical face of the mine bench, um, you know, the, uh, advanced seismic imaging is the only thing that's going to give you any kind of, uh, any kind of image. Um, and then I, I might uh, just show a quick example of, uh, of Remy um, and... Um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, if we have time, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's it's uh, fundamental to the uh, the projects that we've talked about so far uh, between you and me. Um, but um, you know, we'll we'll talk more about Remy later in the, later in the class if um, um, uh, if uh, if there's interest uh, from you guys in surface waves as well as size. As you know, sort of conventional uh, reflection imaging. All right. So let's look at Dixie Valley first. Here's a uh, a map. Uh, Dixie Valley is uh, in the um, in the middle of west uh, west central Nevada, uh, in the uh, central Nevada seismic belt. It was the fifth, the last in a series of. Um, you know, high of earthquakes uh, in the high magnitude sixes, low magnitude sevens that uh, occurred in um, um, uh, 1954. Um, um, uh, well, you know, we're coming up on the uh, on the 110th. Um, I mean, on the uh, 60th anniversary now. Um, and that really uh, was all anybody knew about uh, Nevada. Seismology for uh, for some time uh, were these uh, these earthquakes out west east of Fallon. Um, this is a uh, a map of the uh, of the fault rupture and the thick lines that you might be able to see are the um, um, are the extent of the rupture during uh, the 1954 earthquake. Now uh, we have to uh, be careful as we define that because um, there was an earthquake uh, uh, which is known as the Fairview Peak, uh, Fairview Valley earthquake, uh, which occurred uh, over here in uh, uh, south of uh, southeast of Dixie Valley, uh, and the rupture itself actually crossed uh, US 50, and even back in the 80s, you could still see the about one foot high rupture where it crossed the highway. 
can't see it now, um, but I remember it quite clearly. Should have taken a picture of it back then. Um, but it's eroded away now, the, the scarp and the alluvium. Uh, but the, the scarp is very clear uh, down here south of uh, 39 degrees 15 uh, minutes north. Um, and there's a, this road actually goes out uh, in addition to uh, climbing up to the top of Fairview Peak. Um, it goes to a uh, uh, sort of a, a display of, uh, of the, the fault scarp that's been marked by the uh, highway department. Um, so um, that was a magnitude uh, 7.0 or so uh, and was in a rupture that was mostly south of this map but also up in here. Um, and four minutes and 20 seconds after the initiation of the Fairview Valley earthquake was the initiation of the Dixie Valley earthquake. So the signal from the aftershocks of the uh, Dixie Valley earthquake are, are you know, and the, and the initiation of the Dixie Valley earthquake, they're all kind of lost among the, uh, um, uh, among the, uh, um, the aftershocks of the Fairview Valley earthquake. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and likewise, you know, do we know that these scarps didn't rupture at exactly the same time as the, um, as the, as the Dixie, as the Fairview Valley earthquake? Do we know that they ruptured, the rupture didn't occur on, at the surface here until four minutes and 20 seconds after the, uh, the Fairview Valley earthquake? No, we don't know that. Um, Perhaps they were the same earthquake. They have very different mechanisms. Um, the best anybody can get out of Dixie Valley, it's a low angle normal fault and almost purely a normal rupture, especially in its central area here, um, where the fault is basically striking north-south. There's more strike slip. Um, I think a little bit of, uh, of uh, left lateral uh, component in the, in the fault motion up in this north part that is striking uh, to the northeast. Uh, in any case, um, uh, that was the thing that really grabbed the attention of the, uh, of the geologists and the seismologists. Um, John, uh, um, John Kasky, yeah, he's at uh, uh, San Francisco State. Uh, his map, this is his mapping for his, his PhD thesis here under Wisnowski of the, uh, of the Dixie Valley rupture. Um, have any of you guys visited the Dixie Valley rupture? Yeah, for Wisnowski's. Yeah. Have you ever been out there, Travis? No. Yeah. Well, I'll, 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 I'll have to take you sometime. Um, you can still see uh, a lot of the features, uh, including the hanging fence uh, that uh, you know, were caused by the, the rupture in 1954. Um, Anyway, um, it, it was striking in, uh, in uh, Kasky's analysis uh, that uh, this fault just, you know, geologically, uh, as impossible as it may seem, it has to be a low angle normal fault. Okay, low angle thrust faults, very standard. Um, you know, uh, every accretionary wedge is full of low angle thrust faults. But uh, under standard Andersonian fault mechanics, low angle normal faults are extremely difficult to justify mechanically. Uh, and Rob Abbott and I uh, end our paper, which this is figure one out of, with um, a number of hypotheses. Um, you know, acoustic fluidization by the Fairview uh, Valley earthquake uh, and its ground motion, acoustic fluidization of the material along the fault zone. Uh, injection of high pressure uh, water due to the shaking of the of the um, Fairview Valley earthquake. Uh, you know, having been in a sense an aftershock of the uh, or triggered by the uh, Fairview Valley earthquake, the Dixie Valley earthquake um, is uh, you know probably a rather rare f uh, occurrence. Uh, but it's uh, it's the only example that we have of a of a historic fault rupture um, that uh, uh, that that is um, 
is probably low angle. Okay, so how did we how did we prove that it was it was low angle? All right. Um, well, here's uh, here's the first bit of uh, of indication that we had. This is a a very uh, high resolution uh, seismic survey done up against the scarp. So you can see across the whole top of the thing, the uh, the horizontal distance is only zero to hundred meters. And then uh, we're looking um, uh, we're looking about uh, th this uh, uh, this section has been made uh, approximately. Uh, this is a stack section. I think it is migrated. Is it? No, this is probably the unmigrated one. Uh, this section has been made um, um, uh, approximately um, uh, approximately um, one to one uh, in vertical exaggeration, and the um, uh, you can see this prominent reflector. Okay, now. Um, if you uh, well, our our driller who was doing our shot holes, he drilled into the um, uh, the foot wall of the uh, of the of the scarf up here, and uh, he said, "Yeah, okay, based on on the drilling with my with my air drill, um, I'm I'm going to say fourteen thousand uh, uh, feet per second. So that's about uh, four uh, kilometers per second, I think." And um, and then of course it's alluvium out in the uh, out in the valley. There are boulders, but uh, which is why he had to bring his rock drill. Um, but it's uh, basically soft alluvium, and you can see some of the stratigraphy that's uh, that's within that alluvium. Uh, but this um, this thirty degree dipping uh, uh, reflector was the biggest thing that we saw in the uh, high resolution survey. And uh, it it fits one of Kasky's models uh, really to a T. Okay, uh, when you get within uh, 20, 30 meters of the surface, when this uh, when this fault rupture gets within 20 meters of the surface, um, then you start to develop the uh, graben, and um, you know the 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 actual profile here has been modified by a, a road, so you can't see the the scarp the real scarp on this. Uh, this exact profile, but um, the uh, uh, very unusually wide this very unusually wide graben uh, kind of indicates that the uh, uh, that you have a fifty degree dipping fault, uh, maybe a little bit steeper down to uh, thirty meters depth, and then uh, it's uh, going down at 30, 30 degrees. I mean, these this overlay is from Kasky's paper, which preceded the seismic survey. So really, we tested whether uh, whether this ref you know whether we could see that thirty degree dipping uh, interface. Yes. Is uh, the image kind of washed out near the surface due to gain? Yeah, and um, uh, muting. Muting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is it too noisy near the surface? Right, and and our um, let's see, this is made using a three meter um, uh, group spacing, so. Um, uh, and the and the yeah so it's our three three meter groups and uh, uh, and hundred and uh, I think hundred and fifty meter um, line length cable length so uh, you know within the upper uh, upper few meters and you know even though we had a, a sledgehammer you know, we couldn't really get frequencies you know back as reflections over uh, like one fifty hertz. 150 to 200 hertz is about the limit. So yeah, the upper um, five ten meters is uh, not not really accessible to this uh, this technique. So I was just wondering because over by uh, the back facing 1954 scarp, it yeah, like there's like some data there, and then it kind of when you look at the the actual one that dips east, there's there's not really any data near the surface. That's right. That's right. This this one, you know, there's no reflector there, and um, uh, let's see. Yeah, we have midpoints to the left of this, so I think we did extend, uh, you know, our hammer shots up the hill. Um, so there are, are real midpoints there, but yeah, um, especially in the higher velocity material, you know, the uh, 
with the, the relatively low frequency for this kind of depth, it was, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was too easy to just, you know, we felt that we had to mute out the, those very shallowest reflections. Now, you know, uh, maybe uh, these data could be reprocessed and, uh, and you could pull out the reflections between 200 and 500 hertz and start to fill in that, uh, that, those pieces. Um, that certainly would be possible. Um, yeah, and that's probably an artifact of the filtering. It does look zero phase, doesn't it? Yeah. But it's uh, it's surely an artifact of the filtering because um, you know it's hammer data, so uh, so it should be minimum phase. Yeah. You know. Well, so we can basically assume that black is high impedance event. Is that a safe assumption? Uh, you know, I I don't know what the filtering has done to this, so. As you can kind of see, um, you know, I'm assuming that the 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 zero the, the minimum phase start of the reflection is really where I should be picking it. Okay, I see. Um, but uh, you know, I can't say that um, there hasn't been. Um, let's see, it was processed in Promax, but. We didn't necessarily at that time control whether uh, whether we were, you know, having a, uh, 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 a, f a phase symmetric part of the filtering. You know, we didn't keep all minimum phase filters, uh, uh, perhaps. So that's a possibility that, you know, maybe we should really be picking along the center of the black here, you know, or maybe up here the center of the white. You know, that the, that's that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, so uh, you guys are pointing out that there may be uh, there may be some some work to be done with this uh, yet. Now, here's a display of a what I called a, for this survey a medium resolution record, and um, so what you see here is um, across the top source receiver offset from 1.4 to almost 2.2 kilometers. Okay, so a span of of about uh, 800 meters across the top. And then uh, we're looking at uh, 0.4 to 1.4 uh, seconds of uh, two-way travel time. But this is a, a shot record. Now, the shot is, uh, is way out to the left, right? So you can see that the, uh, the source receiver offset decreases to the left. And so out, uh, you know, at the... Uh, at the left side of the classroom here is where the shot is, um, and zero time is you know up in the ceiling. So um, um, now, what's the what's the first the weir the weirdest thing about this record that 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 you can see? There's something really strange about this shot record, and what is uh, and Travis uh, pipe in if you have any ideas. Uh, what's 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 absolutely bizarre about this record? It doesn't look causal. It doesn't look causal. On the right side, it looks like we have a negative velocity. Yeah. Right. There's a shallow reflector. Well, this is the uh, you know we're looking at the so here's the the noise right up here, right? That's clearly. Um, you know, wind noise, and then here's the uh, the reflection coming in. Or I'm sorry, the waves coming in. You know, this is the first arrival that we've got here, and um, so uh, uh, and it's it's uh, it's at least coming in simultaneously, if not, you know, moving back towards the source. So um, how do you do that? Okay, but if I'm looking at a head wave here at a refraction, how does that how does that shallow reflector have to express itself? Let's say it was perfectly flat, perfectly you know all the way along here, as it almost is. It was um, 
you know, perfectly simultaneous arrival. What would you? Uh, what would be the the cause of, of that? So if you're shooting, if you're shooting up dip, you know, if you're shooting from the low side of a dipping refractor up to the high side, okay. Um, Mm. And I should have, I should have in this PDF, in this PDF, I should have included the movie that uh, you know I made a synthetic that uh, um, that shows this. Um, so that happens with the ground, ground is flat there. Is uh, let's let's say the ground is flat. Okay, it's not, but let's say it is. But would it have to do it like that antithetic fault that's bouncing off of like another side? Actually, uh, let's see. the The west is. Um, uh, the, the west is on the right, the east is on the left. So the, the 1954 rupture at the surface is right there. Okay. Um, and the, you know, the, the low angle fault was supposed to dip to the east, right? So it should be dipping you know, from the upper right to the lower left. Okay. And, so, uh, and the shot is way off to the left. So the uh, refraction. Is climbing up the uh, the ramp, climbing up the thirty degree dipping fault, and it comes in, and the wave uh, the wave comes comes in simultaneously because it's parallel to the ground. Let's say it's perfectly flat. The wave front of the refraction is perfectly flat, and and how do you get that? Well, you get that when the the uh, critical angle is um, is equal to the uh, to the dip, and you shoot up dip. So it turned out to be a very, very simple, um, a very, very simple um, uh, um, a very, very simple uh, 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 geometric situation. And maybe maybe I'd be better off, it would help you more. If I if I drew it, okay. So here we have the surface, and all right. Why am I not seeing that? Okay. And now I'll put in, whoops. Oh, there we go. Oh, well, having acrobat problems like I often do. Well, now I'm trying holding. I was clicking. I guess I got to hold. Okay. So, uh, um, all right. The um, uh, let's see. The source is is out there. No. All right. So the wave comes down, and. Um, Oh, I should use an arrow. Okay. Well, that's interesting. All right. All right, the wave comes down, and at and it's at the critical angle, which uh, uh, how do you define the critical angle? Uh, you know, thinking back to uh, 
freshman freshman optics. Yeah, so I have the velocity of the alluvium up here and the velocity of the granite down below, um, and the critical angle is the uh, the uh, arc sine of the uh, of the uh, alluvial velocity over the uh, over the uh, the granite velocity. The alluvium is about uh, two kilometers per second. The granite is four kilometers per second, according to the driller. So. Um, the ratio of the two is 0 0.5, and the inverse sine of uh, 0 0.5 is 30 degrees. So the critical angle is 30 degrees. Um, and, um, and, and that means that uh, the, um, uh, the wave, um, the, wave uh, the, the head wave, is going to be coming straight up. Okay, so we, uh, we have the head wave coming straight up there. So then if you wrote, you know, if you took this and you uh, rotated that whole thing, you know, to make the, uh, the dip flat, the dip zero, then, you know, you would see the, the sort of standard critical angle diagram that you find in, in your, uh, in your uh, freshman textbooks. So that wave coming, that head wave coming straight up, that's why it arrives simultaneously at um, at the surface. Okay, so um, you know using using Snell's law in that in incredibly simple way, um, I um, uh, let me see. Let's go to. Uh, Back to full screen mode. I guess that works. Um, no, I didn't want that. Uh, I want read mode. Okay, so using that, um, you know, here's if if it um, um, if the dip of the fault to the east from the rupture was as shallow as 21 degrees, then the first arrival would follow this path. If the dip was higher at 39 degrees, then the first arrival would follow this path. It would be, you know, non-simultaneous, uh, um, non but the wrong way, right? Uh, Anti-causal, as, as, as it would appear. Okay, so here's the first piece of evidence that this, uh, you know, directly in a, in a pretty much raw record, that this fault is um, um, uh, has a has a dip that's about thirty degrees. Okay, so um, you know velocity was was critical to this, and uh, here's a here's a size opt at two D result, and you can follow. You can follow the uh, the high velocity transition down. Of course, you know as you go to larger depths, it, be it becomes less well defined by the the surface uh, first arrivals. Okay, but you can follow it down, and it's about thirty degrees. Uh, and you can see there's some lateral velocity variations that that uh, are going to affect the the imaging. This white line is uh, what uh, Satish often defines as the uh, depth of constraint, and below that. You know, we have to just guess about the velocities or extend what we see to greater depth. Uh, here again, you can see, uh, you know, velocity in the alluvium averages 2,000 meters a second. And in the bedrock, at least where we can see it, uh, you know, it's about uh, 4,000 uh, meters per second. And so here's the um, migrated stack that, um, uh, that we got. Um, the fault rupture is is right up here at zero zero. Um, the um, and this is really just plotting the the positive swings right on this uh, on this uh, uh, this this view of the uh, um, of the of the sec of the stack section migrated stack section. The section is three and a half kilometers long, and we're looking down about. Uh, 
two kilometers, and let's see, I think it's uh, one to one uh, vertical exaggeration, if I have that right. No, it's slightly horizontally exaggerated, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is the pretty much standard processing, the old standard processing that shows uh, uh, a lot of the story at uh, 500 meters at a, uh, a kilometer depth. Well, I'm not sure about that. I wonder if this is an early version of the figure that I had labeled wrong. OK, in depth anyway. Um, so uh, here at one kilometer depth, there's this, um, um, there's this uh, uh, prominent reflection, which has uh, you know, some, uh, um, uh, some um, aniforms and sinforms in it. Um, there's this thing that's dipping about 30 degrees that uh, appears to connect, although you can see, you know, maybe it is, uh, uh, you know, it's not put on zero phase, and so, you know, if I was to extend the reflector, it would, it would come, it has to come from that point, and it's coming, you know, along the top of it, right? Not really along the center of it. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, there's this uh, lumpy uh, strong reflection from a uh, a tertiary basalt, which is seen in, in well logs all through the whole area, many basins, called the capping basalt. And um, uh, notice that it dips into the fault plane. Okay? And if you have a Lystric normal fault, you ought to see those dips into the fault plane. And then down here, where you can't see the fault quite so well, you still see the ends of, of this deeper stratigraphy. And again, they're dipping into the fault plane, you know, right there. And a little bit in here, okay, dipping into the fault plane. Uh, probably, yeah, 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 almost certainly. Do you ever have to deal with how do multiples work on land data? Do you have to deal with those? Worry about yeah, them? but they're not so prominent because. Um, you know, they get scattered, especially in, in Great Basin data sets like this, you know, where you've got boulders in the alluvium. Um, we're lucky to see the primary reflections. So we don't, um, you know, there's few, few that I've seen where the multiples are a problem, but uh, that doesn't say they don't happen. But in general, you don't have to right. worry about it too much. Right. Now, you know, as I'm showing you things, if you see something that looks drastically like a multiple, then, uh, um, you know, notice, for instance, I don't think this one here, I don't think it's exactly twice the time of this one here. It's a little bit less than twice the time. Yeah. It's got the, it's got the same dip, not twice the dip, right? Or twice the tangent of the dip. Um, let's see. So uh, here's you know here's mine and Rob's interpretation. This dotted line is a uh, is an earlier interpretation of you know if if it has to be a, if the Dixie Valley fault has to be steep, you know sort of normally steep like we see for you know like the Wells earthquake or uh, um, or the well characterized uh, earthquakes in the 1954 sequence, you know that didn't occur. You know, during a, a, a hot, uh, you know, right during, right after the rupture of another fault, you know, you expect a dip of uh, of 60, 70 degrees on these basin range normal faults, and um, and so that's what this uh, this interpretation hews to, and um, uh, and they try to. Uh, now the other part of the story is that the gravity did not, uh, you know, it really didn't fit um, this um, this step fault kind of uh, kind of interpretation. Uh, the gravity was also much more compatible with the uh, uh, the Dixie Valley fault uh, being uh, a low angle normal fault. Now here's a uh, here's the advanced uh, uh, imaging that we did, 
And as you can see in these early attempts, you know, there's, it's much more um, uh, uh, you know, it's we're, we're showing mostly what's happening to the lower frequencies of the reflections. And uh, we're only able to pick up, you know, we're not able to connect the uh, reflectors very well. You know, that doesn't mean that there's a fault here. It just means that the data don't, uh, don't extend across this gap um, as strongly. And that's because uh, it turns out the, uh, the curvature of a reflector also affects its, its amplitude. Uh, you may have heard about that, and and this you know this uh, this advanced processing did not uh, adjust for that. So um, you know there's the uh, the top of the tertiary capping basalt, uh, and its rollover, and here's the rollover of the bottom of the volcanic sequence and some very early basin fill, which uh, is you know probably twenty million years old, and. Um, um, Probably, uh, um, um, probably, uh, uh, um, uh, probably uh, a, a mixture of volcanic clastics and lake sediments and that sort of thing that was going on out here uh, uh, then. Uh, now, at least I know I know the depth on this section is correct. And the Dixie Valley Fault here is at uh, 30 degrees. Um, so the that 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 view of the early basin fill was important. I mean, first of all, you know, we use the optimized velocities to correct the uh, uh, to correct the the dip and make sure make sure we had that right. You know, I mean, we couldn't say that that we didn't have step faults until. Until we um, um, we had really you know processed it correctly, we'd gone through the whole process, used the velocities that we had, um, you know, used a pre-stack depth migration, and and shown that we didn't have step you know that it, it really didn't you know come down to the to the step fault interpretation, okay, uh, and then that that early basin fill uh, plays a uh, uh, a prominent role, and here's a, um, a kind of a broader view of that section that uh, Rob put together for for this um, this publication. Turns out this capping basalt, you find it on the top of the mountain ranges too. It's really it was um, it was there when the the basin was um, uh, only partly developed. So. Um, uh, our conclusion from this basically boils down to having the uh, the Dixie Valley Fault be a a um, a, a uh, low angle normal fault ever since the Oligocene. Okay, now it it only it was initiated in this era of very thick volcanic accumulation and in the Clan Alpine Range. There was a big uh, uh, volcanic center. Uh, you know, giant uh, calderas. Uh, they were sending uh, ash flows all the way to to the Pacific, because the Sierra Nevadas were not a barrier then. Um, and you can find um, what's known as the the Nine Hill Tuff uh, all the way over in Sonoma County. So um, uh, this uh, when this area was very hot, 22 million years ago, uh, or well, no, actually back to almost 30 million years ago. And so uh, you could you could imagine that uh, when uh, the area was very hot and there were lots of volcanic fluids coursing around, that uh, you could initiate low angle normal faulting. Okay, so so the first part of the basin, this this uh, deeper sequence that we now you know know you know due to the uh, advanced seismic imaging, we have the the thickness of it uh, nailed down, and we have the fact that it was lystric and and those. Those um, set, you know, the, the, those oldest sediments are dipping into the fault as well. So we know that the whole thing uh, initiated as uh, as a low angle normal fault, and then, you know, maybe whenever it's triggered by a nearby uh, earthquake, it can rupture again as a, as a low angle normal fault, and it's been doing that since the 
capping basalt, which is 13 to 15 MA, um, you know, leaving the capping basalt up there on the top of Table Mountain in the Stillwater Range. So um, the uh, 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 what we found is really a pretty boring story, where uh, you know, by chance, when it was uh, very hot and volcanic, we initiated a a low angle normal fault, and it's just found found enough opportunities to keep going uh, ever since. Uh, whenever it's triggered. Okay, one more quick example. The uh, uh, here's a map of the uh, upheaval dome area uh, in uh, sort of northwestern Canyonlands National Park. Um, you can see its position in Utah there, just off. Uh, oh, maybe right there at the upper left corner of the map is the uh, Green River, and its confluence with the Colorado River is um, uh, about three map, uh, map heights uh, to the south. And um, we're uh, north of uh, Moab, Utah, and north of uh, Arches National Park. And uh, you can uh, drive out uh, onto um, the island in the sky on this, on this road and come out to this, uh, this overlook uh, and look down into the central depression of, uh, of Upheaval Dome. And um, uh, you can hike uh, in what's called Syncline Valley along the ring syncline here. Very obvious. Um, you can see uh, thrust faults that are, uh, uh, you know, strangely in the middle of the syncline and um, uh, verging in toward the center of the, uh, of the depression. Uh, you can also see uh, out here uh, normal faults, which are dipping uh, uh, and, and offsetting down toward the, the central depression. So the, uh, the story here that uh, Gene Shoemaker uh, suggested and, and my colleagues uh, Ken Herkenhoff, Brian Kreans. Uh, Herkenhoff is now at um, the USGS Astrogeology Lab in Flagstaff. Uh, been involved with uh, all the Mars probes. Um, the story that uh, 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 that we have uh, can take uh, three different variations. Um, there's the um, the original story, and here's you know look at the topography here. Well, this is Canyonlands National Park, right? We got the island in the sky there. Here's the position of this well. Uh, there's the central depression of Upheaval Dome. Uh, and, and you can see in the stratigraphy there, it's, uh, it's a domal uh, uh, structure, Syncline Valley uh, in the ring syncline, and then the flat Colorado uh, plateau stratigraphy on, on either side. Uh, and there is a, you know, a kilometer thick uh, salt and mud called the Paradox, which you guys have, may have encountered if you did any work uh, um, you know, in the Rockies. Um, in this area, it's quite thick, and uh, there are salt domes. Uh, uh, they're really uh, salt anticlines. Um, you know, the, the town of Moab sits in a in the middle of a huge, uh, twenty mile long salt anticline. This is a little, you know, um, it's not even a one mile uh, central depression here, uh, but there's a suggestion that uh, um, that you have uh, a salt dome which has caused this doming. And that's what everybody thought Upheaval Dome was until Shoemaker came along, and he was calculating his asteroid impact rates, and he said, you know, given the age of the Colorado Plateau and this and the you know flat stratigraphy there, there's got to be a um, a five kilometer crater somewhere in the Colorado Plateau, and um, and then he looked at the map and he said, oh, of course, it's Upheaval Dome. All right. Now, this uh, the central depression, the ring syncline, is pretty near circular here, um, and that does differ. You know, it didn't bother Shoemaker uh, that uh, that that it really ought to be a uh, um, a salt dome because the uh, the salt uplifts uh, in this part of the Colorado Plateau are all these you know long narrow anticlines, and Upheaval Dome is the only one that's circular. 
So it, it seemed unlikely too that it was it was a uh, to him that it was a salt uh, a salt dome. Um, of course, there's no um, there's no salt found in the the middle. You know, there's no there's no mapped uh, uh, paradox uh, down there in the middle. Um, so you have to have this uh, um, this dome, uh, uh, you know, sort of hidden, and that would mean that um, uh, it has to um, uh, you have the ring syncline should increase in depth or in in uh, uh, in relief as you go down. Right, a salt dome is driven from below, so. The ring syncline should get more prominent as you go down. Now, what what we discovered with the two seismic sections that I'll show you is that um, um, you know we we couldn't match the depth that the uh, the salt should have had in the ring syncline um, in uh, um, of the of the stratigraphy. Okay, it was you know the, under the salt dome uh, hypothesis, it was. Uh, um, shallower than uh, uh, than it should have been. Um, so, uh, our, our, some good colleagues of ours at uh, Utah State and uh, and Exxon. Um, I don't remember the Exxon authors. Maybe you met them. Um, uh, they proposed a uh, pinched off salt diet here. Okay. Now it seemed a little strange to us, and you know, Ken and Brian, they they. They walked. They climbed every bit of the Central Depression. They found not one scrap of um, of paradox salt, not one scrap of paradox mud. Um, you know, it's just it's just not there. You would think if it was a pinched off salt diapir that you would find something. Okay, but it's not there. Um, nonetheless, okay. If you have this uh, this pinched off salt diapir, then you end up you know drawing salt from uh, from you know you draw salt and then you you know it, the salt rises up higher and then gets eroded away later um, because this is uh, you know at least a kilometer down from uh, uh, has been eroded a kilometer down from from uh, where it was uh, in the tertiary. Anyway. Um, you can make a pinched off salt diapir uh, uh, model match the depths that you see in the well, okay, and in the uh, uh, and in the seismic. Uh, on the other hand, if you drive the upheaval dome and you drive its development from the uh, from above, okay, with a with an impact that blows out a uh, a central a a, a cavity. And then the cavity fills by uh, slumping and development of a central peak in the center. So here's what the original crater form would have looked like. Okay. Uh, you can you can let the uh, the paradox and the Hermosa limestone that's above it, Cutler sands, I think, the bottom of the Cutler at least. You can let it alone. Okay. Nothing nothing has to happen to it. And and. It's uh, you know the seismic sections show that it's flat, right? The seismic sections uh, don't show this uh, uh, this ring, but you could argue uh, that uh, you know for the the pinched off salt dip here, you could argue that that could be very broad and we wouldn't see it. But um, you know for an impact that allows it to be very simply flat because it's driven from above. All right. Now. We had a lot of uh, a lot of noise in these uh, in these records, um, and uh, some of it is um, basically reflections from the canyon walls. I mean, you know, this is uh, I don't think this topography is exaggerated here. Yeah, no vertical exaggeration. So that is really stiff topography in that area, and uh, you know, in these records from um, the line. Uh, on the kind of inside of the ring syncline, uh, you know, there's a lot of surface waves, as you see always. Uh, and so uh, we used a simple dip filter, which I think I showed you at the. Uh, this is Hale's dip filter. I think I showed that to you at the uh, um, 
at the very end of 706, did we get to the hail dip filter? Oh, okay. Then we're going to get to it in this in this class. So we, you know, service waves and uh, reflections from canyon walls, those are all those all have a, a lower apparent velocity than than the reflections. So we just you know dip filtered away the the more dipping stuff in the in the shot records, and we emphasize the reflections. Are you talking about filtering in the wave number frequency domain? Uh, no, this is actually the dip filter actually is in. Uh, Tx, um, and it but it uses a, a very simple tri-diagonal matrix operator, just like we use for uh, finite differencing in uh, in seven hundred six. Sorry, we haven't done that yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that'll be uh, yeah. We'll uh, we'll get to, we'll get to that. So here's the final section, and uh, uh, after taking those dip filtered uh, records and uh, uh, and and then doing a pre-stack depth migration, uh, which I'll probably sometimes call a uh, Kirchhoff migration here. Um, so uh, uh, and on the right is the um, the the Buck Mesa log, and I think I showed this to you in seven oh six and said, all right, I took the log as a time series or or really a depth series, and I just bandpass filtered it. And that approximated a you know a very crude kind of, of modeling. So the the seismic trace you would get from this um, this log is this uh, you know gray and, and white and black strip to the left of the log, and it's really just a, a low pass filter of the uh, of the log. So you can see a um, uh, you can see the top of the paradox. Okay, but that's not as strong a reflection as these mud stringers within the paradox. So that's what what these are. Here's the top of the paradox. Maybe it is offset a little bit. Okay, we're on the you know we're in the axis of the ring syncline. And how about that? You know, if this was a um, if we were in the middle of the ring syncline, um, and it's it's due to to doming of the paradox salt, then you know there should be a much more prominent of a syncline. On the paradox salt, okay, and there certainly should not, you know, the top of the paradox salt should not have this uh, this uplift in it, okay. So again, that's uh, uh, you know, it's it, we're, it's really showing the image is showing the opposite of what you should see if it was a salt dome. All right, it's a force from above, and then the uh, the normal faulting. There's uh, there's faults in this interpretation too. Uh, and, and in fact, here's a thrust fault that uh, that cuts up, uh, you know, toward the uh, the central peak. And uh, you have these, uh, you know, listric normal faults on the outside of the ring syncline. They bottom out of the ring syncline and then turn around and become thrust faults and uplift the central peak of the crater. When the, you know, you blow a hole in the earth and it's unstable, so it all the edges all fall in, and they crush up into the central peak, and that's exactly what we're uh, what we're seeing here. And you can see that that where the um, uh, where the where the well is, you know, we can match the reflectivity. I, I think pretty nicely. At least this is one of the better uh, uh, better you know log uh, ties that I've been able to make to my data sets. To comment, it looks too high at frequency to log. So you used what a Richter wavelet and you can vault it with the uh, so, impedance. So, um, what I essentially did is, uh, uh, if you convolve a Richter wavelet with the with the log, right? Then that's the same thing as um, as uh, taking the uh, uh, the spectrum of a, or not the spectrum, the Fourier transform of a Richter wavelet, and multiplying it by the, uh, um, um, and multiplying it by the, uh, um, by the by the Fourier transform of the log. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
Uh, and what does the Fourier transform of Wicker, Wicker wavelet look like? It's uh, it's a uh, uh, it's it looks like a Gaussian a bit. Yeah, yeah. So um, what I did was I multiplied a boxcar, okay, with the same you know frequency bounds as the Ricker wavelet Fourier transform. I multiplied a boxcar by the Fourier transform of the uh, you know the boxcar is just the limits of the of a very simple bandpass filter. Actually, it was a trapezoid. It was a trapezoidal filter in in the Fourier domain. Okay, so so it comes out looking like you know just this extremely simple trapezoidal bandpass filter comes out looking just like the um, um, uh, just like uh, uh, convolving it with a with a Ricker wavelet, except there isn't much control on the phase, right? I mean, you do the proper convolution by a Ricker wavelet, you've got much more control on the phase. Um, Right, and this data was not. It's um, it was uh, 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 weight drop. So again, it was minimum phase. How did you choose your frequency? I just think it looks the frequency is too high on your synthetic side. Oh, oh, here. Yeah, I think maybe if you would have dropped it, maybe the match would have been more. Hmm. Yeah, because I I chose I chose the central frequency of the. Of the Ricker wavelet to be similar to the central, and I'm, I'm talking spatial frequency here. The central spatial frequency of the um, of these reflections over here. Yeah, it just looks a little too high. That's all. Yeah, I mean, if I'd chosen it a bit lower, like the central frequency of of the paradox reflections are a bit lower. Yeah, you're right. Maybe that would have been. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe it would have been better. Maybe those stringers. You Well, they're they're important though in the in the story here. But I mean, in terms of making that giant thick reflector at the paradox, it doesn't look like we're actually imaging stringers. That's all. You mean? Uh, well, like these are the these are the stringers right here. You know, that's the low pass. Oh, I see. So these are this. You're right. I mean, this is higher frequency than that. Stringers. Look yeah. Pretty well yeah. Tuning. Yeah. And, uh, maybe if the log, because I know that's something that I had to play around with a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I just, uh, you know, I saw, I saw the, the, the uh, relative amplitude match, and I said, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah. That there's, there's, yeah, just there could be a lot to do there. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I was satisfied. That's enough to get it published. So, if it's a series of stringers, then even if it was below each stringer was below the tuning frequency, the average rock property would be enough to cause a reflection, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's what, and that's what we're seeing here. They'd be adding up if they were you know, tuning. Right. I mean, maybe maybe this is just the second. You know. Okay, I, I believe that black one. Right, the first yeah, one. Like top of salt. Well, the top of the salt is right there. Okay. Okay, and here's the you know there's the top of the first stringer of the upper stringer. Right, this crazy thing. Right, it's got uh, very high velocity uh, uh, anhydrite on either side, and in the middle is this is this wet mud, wet salty mud, with with very large uh, travel time. Um. And then here's, you know, that's the first ring, and there's probably more rings down there that I'm not showing. Yeah, I like the geometry story. I just was... Right. Okay. Well, I've gone over time. So, uh, um, you know, if you have uh, any more observations or questions about the uh, motivational examples here, um, let me know. And uh, I'll start uh, tomorrow at 9. I'll start into um, uh, notes number 1.